Okay, so um, my talk is much more uh, biologically oriented than the last couple we saw. Um, so to sort of help you guys change gears a little bit, I want to start with a very brief and very basic introduction to what the problem is I'm interested in. So I'm interested in studying gene regulation. Um, all of your cells have a copy of your DNA. Each copy of the DNA has genes on it, and these genes are what I'm interested in. In particular, the genes encode for proteins. Um, they do this through a two-step process where the gene is copied into an mRNA through transcription, and then the mRNA is translated, the, the nucleotide sequence is translated into an amino acid sequence, uh, and this makes the protein. And the reason that this is interesting in general is that just about any function that you can think of happening in a cell is being carried out by a protein. So if I want to know what a cell's capabilities are, what a cell can do, I want to know what proteins are expressed in the cell, and so I want to know what genes are being turned on in the cell. So this actually feeds back on itself. Among the functions that a protein can do is it can come back to where the chromosomes, where the genes are in the cell, and it can bind to the DNA close to, the, uh, to, to a particular gene. And when it binds close to this gene, it can affect how this gene is transcribed. It can make it transcribe faster. It can make it transcribe slower. Um, and in things that we call activation or repression. And, and when a protein does this, we give it a special name. We call it a transcription factor, um, since it's a factor in the extent of transcription. Uh, so if you think about this problem in general for a little bit, you know, you realize that, okay, so a gene is producing a protein, and then the protein is affecting a gene. A transcription factor may regulate hundreds of genes, thousands of genes. Um, some of those genes will also be transcription factors, and those transcription factors will then regulate other genes, sometimes some of the same genes. And so you start building up very complex, um, very interconnected gene regulatory networks. Um, and understanding how these function, how they're put together is very fundamental to understanding how this cell itself is working. So I'm, I'm interested here in one specific part of this problem. In particular, uh, so given a transcription factor that I think I'm interested in, uh, which genes is the transcription factor regulating? Is it turning those genes on? Is it turning those genes off? Um, so from a, for a first order, the, the behavior of the transcription factor is, is it an activator? Is it a repressor? Um, and when, you're, when you start thinking about this problem in uh, especially mammalian systems, another wrinkle comes about in terms of which, figuring out which genes the transcription factor regulates, because you have binding sites for the transcription factor in promoters or enhancers. And the basic definition of these is promoters, the idea is so the, the gene is this little orange box and it starts at the arrow. The binding site is this pink region and the promoter is very close to the start site of a gene. So if a transcription factor binds to the promoter and I know where the binding site is, I can measure this experimentally. Um, it's not difficult to figure out which gene that binding site is probably regulating because it's, it's right there. Uh, the other side are enhancers. Enhancers will bind somewhere a long way away from any genes. And now when I start thinking about the, the range at which I expect an enhancer might function, it's often going to be the case that there will be multiple genes within that range. Um, and it won't be obvious just from the picture of the binding site where it's binding. So that was a schematic I was showing you. It can, it's actually very easy to come up with a very nasty example, given a little bit of experimental data. Uh, so this is a binding site for a transcription factor called PU1. This is in mice. Um, uh, ChIP-seq is an experimental method for uh, measuring transcription factor binding sites genome-wide all in one shot. It's very nice. Um, and if you look at this binding site and you look at all the regions, all the genes within 100,000 base pairs of the, the binding site, you can count up all these genes and there are, there are 20 of them total. So now to go back to this, this idea I was talking about before about promoters versus enhancers, in, in mammalian systems we would, we, we could say promoters will be at least probably 2,000 base pairs from the start site of a gene. They'll actually probably usually be closer, but to be, to be very liberal, we can say 2,000 base pairs. Um, and so if a, if a binding site is farther than this distance from the start site of a gene, we'll call it an enhancer. Um, you can't tell from the plot, this, this gene is the closest one, and I'll tell you it's about 5,000 base pairs. So this, this is an enhancer binding site. Um, the way that enhancers function is, is 
there still has to be a physical interaction with the beginning of the gene. And so the, the binding site will be somewhere here in the middle of the DNA. And DNA, of course, is a long, floppy polymer. And so the DNA will, at some point, fold, loop, and it'll bring the binding site in this very far away place to the beginning of a gene, physically, spatially. And then it can interact with the beginning of a gene. So this long-range looping interaction can be very, very long-range. It can be tens of thousands of base pairs. Uh, it can be hundreds of thousands of base pairs. Um, and in, for, for reference, the length of a chromosome in, in mouse or humans is around 100 million base pairs. So this, is, this distance is still very small compared to the overall length of the molecule, but it's pretty big compared to the spacing between genes, which tends to be around 20,000 base pairs. This varies a lot as well, but it's a, a general rule of thumb. You know, so I've shown you one particularly nasty example here where I have 20 genes that I can choose from. But on average, what I've seen from, from ChIP-seq binding sites um, is that you, add, you end up with an average of at least two or three genes within, say, a 100,000 base pair region around the binding site. So this is a very common problem. Um, and it's a very common problem. It's, it's one biologists have been working with for quite a while because these experimental methods have been around for a while. Um, and, and, but there's never really been a good procedure for figuring out which gene is the target. The, the typical naive assumption is to say, well, I'm going to assume that whatever gene is closest, that's the one being regulated. Um, so this is an idea I'm calling proximity. Um, and the only point I want to make about that is that, as I will show in a few slides, uh, that's actually not a good idea. Um, you can lose a lot of important information doing that. So when I started working on this project with a collaboration with a, a couple of biologists, we realized that we needed some more data, some more information to tackle this problem. And in particular, we thought about, well, the transcription factor is supposed to be regulating genes. We can measure gene expression. Um, there was a mention of DNA microarray in the, the keynote yesterday. Um, we can also use RNA-seq for measuring gene expression. And so what if we look at the gene behavior profiles for all the genes that are within this, this big region around the binding site? Um, I would posit that the genes that are actually being regulated should behave in some reasonably consistent manner because they're all being regulated by the transcription factor. So the cartoon version of this is, so I have a binding site here and another binding site in this triangle. There are three genes close to this binding site, two, two genes close to this binding site, and I've measured uh, cartoon gene expression for each of these. And I would infer by looking at these expression that the, the red profile and the orange profile look pretty similar to each other. The other guys are different. Uh, and so my inference would be that this gene and this gene are being regulated and the others are not. Um, so this is the idea. That's the very qualitative idea. We, or I, I put this together in a more quantitative, precise method. And when you do anything in bioinformatics, you come up with a new method. Uh, you have to give it a cute name. So we called ours ember. You can see what it means, and you have to remember to accent the R when you say it uh, if you want to spell it out. Um, but the idea is it's, it's a three-step process that I've already sort of outlined. Um, I wanted to find gene behavior profiles for each gene, and I actually do this. There's sort of a couple steps to it. I actually want to look at comparisons between different, ex uh, different conditions that I measured gene expression in. Uh, and then for each of those conditions, what I'm really interested in is, did the gene increase its expression? Did it decrease its expression? Did it not change in its expression? This is the main effect that I think that the transcription factor is having. Um, so we end up just doing five possible discrete classifications for gene behavior. It went up. It went down. It went up by a lot or a small amount. It went down by a lot or a little bit. Um, or it didn't change. Um, and the next step, I, I, we. We still stick with the proximity idea that there has to be some sort of proximal effect, but we try to be as inclusive as possible. So we say, OK, all the genes within, say, 100,000 base pairs, I'm going to assume that one of those genes, maybe, is actually being targeted. The rest are not. But I'm hoping that I'm getting all the actual targets in this region. So I'm going to call these potential binding sites or potential, potential gene targets. Um, that we're going to then call in the next step to try to identify the actual gene targets. So I said the, the basic idea here, um, and this is, this is the step where all the, the real interesting computational work happens. Um, but I'm not going to talk about it now, because I want to talk about results in the next slide. 
Um, the basic idea, though, is I'm going to search among the various potential targets for the gene. I'm going to look at the gene expression profiles for each of these genes. And I'm going to try to come up with a set of these genes, a fairly large set, that has a very self-consistent set of expression profiles. And once I've done that, I'll have a, a model for how the target genes behave. I'll have a model for how the background genes, the non-target genes, behave. And I can score each gene according to which model it fits best. So what I end up with then is, is now for each binding site, I have its nearby genes, and I have a score for each gene. And here I take the gene with a high score based on some threshold, and I say that's my target gene. So these I'm going to call the, the ember targets, so-called. Uh, the other nice output of this is because we're looking at expression data, we get the behavior of the target genes, which should tell you what the effect of the transcription factor is. I can say if the transcription factor is an activator, is it a repressor, what is it doing in different contexts? And so the, the expression patterns I'll be showing you in a few slides, there are these plots with these boxes of red and green squares. Um, and when I, when I show you an actual one, I'll try to tell you a little bit more about what it means. So that's the basic idea. Um, and so as I said, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about the method because I think it's actually more interesting to talk about some of the results we've gotten because I think we've had some interesting results. Um, some of the, the first interesting ones are actually validating the method. This is a new computational method. It gives me an answer. How do I know that the answer is any good? Um, and in that context, I want to validate that the target genes I get are good in some way, and I want to validate that the expression pattern, the behavior that I'm inferring for the transcription factor is also correct. Um, and then at the end, um, hopefully not too rushed, I want to tell you about an application that we've used the method for, for discovering new biology. Okay. So the, the validating the target genes, we looked at three transcription factors in a human breast cancer cell line. The basic thing you need to know is that these three transcription factors have been implicated in various ways in the development of breast cancer. So we took a list of genes that were known to also be involved in breast cancer. We wanted to see if these were overrepresented among the ember targets for these transcription factors. This is what you see in the red plots here, and we saw that indeed they were, um, which was nice. So we're, we're doing something correct. Um, what was also interesting is if we looked at this, we took this very simple proximity idea I told you about earlier, the, na the naive assumption that the closest gene is the regulated one, and we tried to see if there was also overrepresentation of breast cancer genes here. Uh, these are the green boxes, and there's not. Um, so it's not only do you need a method like Ember to associate genes correctly, um, but, but if you use the simple assumption, you'll get not just a worse answer, but a wrong answer. You won't get the answer. Um, so this is the expression patterns I showed you. Um, this is in a different setting. We're looking at a transcription factor, STAT5, and we're looking at it in the context of a particular chromatin mark. So uh, there are proteins called histones that are wrapped up in the DNA, and particular chemical modifications to these histones are associated with different states of DNA, like activated genes or repressed genes. Um, and this, this particular mark is, is known to be associated with repressed genes. So I'm going to look at the left-hand figure first. We're looking at now uh, just the, the STAT5 binding sites. This is a transcription factor. Um, we're looking at expression across a range of um, B cell developmental states. So we're starting in uh, uh, cells in the bone marrow, and then we're going out to uh, fully mature B cells that are part of your immune system. And we're comparing ex gene expression at each of these stages to the expression at the pro-B stage, which is the third one over. Um, this is where the binding data were taken. And so what we see is if you compare gene expression at any other stage to expression at pro-B, they're all down-regulated. The ember targets are down-regulated, which means that at pro-B, they are activated relative to other stages. Since binding is at pro-B, this would implies STAT5 as an activator, um, which is sort of the, the uh, behavior that we had already known for it. Um, but actually, the, the awful, almost the stronger validation is on the right-hand side, where we look at the coincidence between STAT5 and these chromatin marks. Um, so I said these chromatin marks are associated with repressed genes, with non-differentially expressed genes. And that's exactly what we see. Genes uh, associated with this chromatin mark by Ember um, are non-differentially expressed across the range of, of B cell development. So this is a nice, very visual validation that, that we're getting the correct uh, implications. Okay, so I think I have to go quickly, but 
Uh, this is the, the biological application to discover some new biology we were looking at. Um, we were looking at transcription factor IRF4 in this B cell effector fate choice context. So B cells, I, I sort of mentioned already, B cells are a part of your adaptive immune system. Um, each B cell recognizes a specific antigen like another protein. Um, and when it recognizes that antigen, it's capable of producing antibodies to tag that antigen and, and take it out of the cell. And it does this, it has to make a, uh, a cell fate choice. So an activated B cell that's recognized an antigen can transition to a plasma cell and start pumping out antibodies, or it can migrate to a germinal center where it'll start uh, mutating its antibody gene. Um, and after it's done this, it can still become a plasma cell. And the main importance for IRF4 in this context is if you knock IRF4 out of these cells, none of this happens. You just get stuck at the activated B cell state. So we know it's a key transcription factor. Um, the other important thing to know about IRF4 is it cannot actually bind to DNA by itself. It has to bind with a binding partner. Um, one of the well-known binding partners is this other transcription factor, PU1. So we looked at that one also. Okay. Um, so I'll go very quickly, and then I'll be done. Um, so there's a whole lot to this story, and I could spend 40 minutes talking about all of it. So I'm going to give you like a very, very brief rundown. Um, for IRF4 and PU1 binding sites, the sites that are co-bound by these two transcription factors, we were able to infer that the, the transcription factor acted as a, a repressor and that it was pushing genes towards a germinal center stage. So pushing genes to the, the right-hand side here, or pushing cells, I should say, to the right-hand side here. Um, for the binding sites that were not coincident with PU1, the story is a little bit more complicated, but we could see that these binding sites acted as, as both activators and repressors. Um, so there's a, a mix of functions here. But that regardless, the, the binding sites tended to push the cells towards the plasma cell phase, so over to the left-hand side. Um, so there's a, a sort of composite picture we came up with about how the concentration of IRF4 and the binding partner of IRF4 affects your cell phase state. Um, and, uh, but I don't really have time to, to go over that, unfortunately, right now. Um, so with that, I want to thank um, the, the Krell Institute and, and the DOE CSGF for their support over my uh, graduate school work. I want to thank all the biological collaborators I worked with, um, and there are too many to mention, but the bolded names are the ones whose data are presented uh, today. Um, for my practicum, I was supervised by Bill Lavichek and Fang Ping Mu, uh, which was a great experience. Um, and then my advisor, Aaron Dinner, um, was also a great advisor during grad school. Um, and now I'm at uh, UIC, sort of, I've moved three miles up and north, um, but I want to thank them for hiring me. Thanks.